lot of research uh, now showing that poultry are sensitive as well to mycotoxins. Uh, they may require higher contamination in the feed uh, to get clinical symptoms. So the very famous one being uh, necrosis of the tongue or the beak when uh, they are exposed to T2 toxin, for example. However, it's been shown that more common mycotoxins like dioxinivalenol, DOM, also known as vomitoxin, or fumonisin, do affect the gut health of poultry um, in a subclinical way. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast brought to you by White Genetics. Uh, where we bring you the latest in poultry nutrition and industry uh, trends um, in approximately 10 minutes or less. Uh, my name is Sam Rochel. I'm Associate Professor of Poultry Nutrition at Auburn University and one of the co-hosts of the show. Uh, and today I am joined by a guest, uh, Marie Galasso, uh, who's going to be talking with us a little bit about uh, her background and, and current work in, in mycotoxins. So uh, great to have you on and, and thanks for your time, Marie. Thank you, Sam. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to participate to this podcast. Absolutely. So can you give us just a little bit of background uh, of your, your career trajectory and what uh, you do in your current role? Sure. Uh, so I'm currently the global manager for feed quality solutions at EW Nutrition, a German-based uh, feed additive company. So I basically work with uh, toxin risk management as well as other feed quality solutions like antioxidants, preservatives. Um, I have a 15 years background dealing with mycotoxins uh, and the feed additive globally. Proven on the farm, trusted on the plate, let our technologies help make your production goals a reality. Learn from the experts how carbohydrates can improve nutrient utilization, gut health technologies differ by type, and how liquid smoke can light your bird performance on fire. Kerry isn't just leading in animal agriculture, we're innovating it. Yeah, no, that's very good. Thank you. So, uh, you know, we hear a lot about uh, mycotoxins in, in the animal nutrition space. Uh, you know, in general, we kind of think about poultry maybe being a little bit less sensitive to mycotoxins than, than other species, but can you just give us kind of a uh, you know, a general overview of mycotoxins, the risk, and, and as poultry nutritionists, why we should be concerned about mycotoxins. Yes, indeed, it is one of the myths that uh, poultry are not sensitive to mycotoxins or at least less sensitive, and that we should only care for mycotoxins when we're dealing with swine or uh, ruminants, for example. However, there are a lot of research uh, now showing that poultry are sensitive as well to mycotoxins. Uh, they may require higher contamination in the feed uh, to get clinical symptoms. So the very famous one being uh, necrosis of the tongue or the beak when uh, they are exposed to T2 toxin, for example. However, it's been shown that more common mycotoxins like dioxinivalenol, DOM, also known as vomitoxin, or fumonisin do affect the gut health of poultry um, in a subclinical way, I would say. So it will impact the feed conversion ratio, the growth rate. It will impair vaccination efficacy. It will globally affect the immune system. So you, in the end, get a very unspecific uh, effect, consequences of the mycotoxin exposure that is pretty hard to diagnose, but is there and at the end of the day is uh, causing damage to the performance, to the well-being, to the profitability of the productions. Yeah, makes sense. So what are some of the you know, risk factors? Like uh, obviously I'm you know, here in the US, uh, you're uh, across the, the ocean in France right now. Obviously we're, you know, the grain industry is a global industry, so we're, we're shipping uh, grain from the U.S., uh, Latin America, throughout the world. Uh, so what are some of the, you know, is it, is it uh, I know we talk a lot about regional impacts and seasonality. Uh, what are some of the risk factors, certain mycotoxins that, that you really see uh, carrying certain risks in different years? And can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, so there are definitely geographical regional trends with mycotoxin risk. 
different climate occur in different regions, and this is influencing the type of fungi that grows and ultimately the type of mycotoxins that can be developed. Uh, mycotoxins, they, stem from, they are a defense mechanism, a defense uh, metabolites from fungi. So the climate is really what triggers the risk. In the Northern Hemisphere, you get more of the fusarium mycotoxins, especially Dawn or Zeralinon. In the Southern Hemisphere, you get more of the aflatoxins coming from uh, aspergillus or fumanisins, for example, because they require hotter temperatures, typically. So you have these regional trends, but then locally, you have a lot of diversity as well because you have a lot of local climatic events that influence these factors. Then the type of the grain, uh, fusarium, they love corn, uh, so this is why corn is the most at risk. Uh, it's just, they love it, it grows very well there. Um, there is less risk, globally speaking, on soybean, for example. So these are things to consider uh, when buying grains. Where does it come from? What were the climatic conditions that year for the season? Um, how was it stored? Uh, it's fresh or old. So as producers are doing this and taking all those factors into account, I mean, uh, and in doing mycotoxin monitoring, what are really the risk thresholds that you that you consider for mycotoxins that producers should really uh, watch out for? This is the golden question. Sure. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to establish a threshold uh, risk levels. Um, so the starting point definitely is the contamination in the grain. Uh, how much of which mycotoxin is present, uh, and if we are facing a single mycotoxin contamination, so if the feed is contaminated with only one mycotoxin, then it's uh, easy enough, I would say, to evaluate uh, risk levels. But if you start to have several mycotoxins present, you're already uh, getting in trouble uh, in, in this uh, assessment. Uh, they are sometimes antagonistic, sometimes additive, sometimes synergistic effects between the mycotoxins. And those trends, those, uh, this behavior between mycotoxins, these interactions, depend on the level of the mycotoxin. So two given mycotoxins do not interact the same way at a low or at a high level. So there is a very high complexity there that makes it uh, difficult. Then, of course, you have to consider the type of production, the type of animals, uh, young animals, older animals. Sometimes you have a you even have a gender effect uh, and the health pressure on the farm. There are so many criteria, it's, it's really hard to define uh, such, such levels. Um, meanwhile, uh, the authorities, whether in the US or in Europe or in most countries, are giving guidelines, usually based on um, single contamination, uh, so once we, I mean, we can, we can use them, but knowing how they were established. And uh, very often times they are established considering one mycotoxin at a time and preventing clinical damage or human health. Uh, that means not having the mycotoxin transferred to the animal products that the human will consume. Okay. Makes sense. So important to keep in mind when we look at, at uh, guidelines from regulatory agencies, that's often more about uh, food safety in very isolated cases and not necessarily what's going to reflect the impact on performance when we have different mycotoxins, even at, at, at lower levels. And, and when we're concerned about subclinical too, not just the, the clinical signs. So exactly. Uh, yeah. Good point to keep in mind. You mentioned some of the, the geographical regions and the seasonality uh, but obviously, we have to think about longer term kind of changes in the global weather patterns and, and uh, climate change. I mean, how do you see that affecting uh, mycotoxins throughout the world? Yeah, this is one of the hot topic, I would say. Um, we can think about it on the short term and mid long term effects. Uh, on the short term, we this is something we already observe. We are having due to a very odd climatic event. Uh, we see odd uh, contamination patterns. Uh, we had the example in, in France, in northwestern France, a couple of years ago, 
where uh, it was an extremely dry year, which, trust me, in northeastern uh, north northwestern France does not happen very often. And this very dry year made it that a different Fusarium uh, genus developed. Uh, it was Fusarium poi, to be specific, against Fusarium graminearum, that is the standard. And this changed completely the trend of contamination. We had nivalenol dominating corn silage contamination, typically, against a don that is the usual. And this was unexpected and could have been unseen. On medium long term, uh, what is expected is a change in those global trends. Uh, we expect um, a shift in the aflatoxin contamination. For example, it will go more, more and more in the northern hemisphere. We, in the longer term, we also expect less arable land uh, to be available. And this will increase the pressure also on the fungi that will develop. All right. Yeah. Very neat. So I would have, I guess I kind of expected to to think about as uh, places get warmer, we see a shift, but you know, even in places where we're already concerned about mycotoxins, the shift in the type of, of, of organisms that are growing and, and how that results. So I think that that's pretty uh, interesting insight. And obviously there'll be a lot to, to be learned on that in the coming years. So we talked a lot about like these risk factors and things to consider. What about, you know, how do we really uh, monitor, prevent and, and, and mitigate this? The good news there is that we know more or less uh, what are the good practices to manage mycotoxin risk. Um, it all starts with uh, understanding the risk, uh, knowing uh, what are mycotoxins, being aware uh, that they can be a risk even for poultry, uh, as we touched, and uh, to monitor it. Um, we, we cannot manage it properly if we don't know what's there. So knowing about this global trend is a starting point, and this can help to define a control plan. Uh, so then for the new harvest, depending on where we are, we know what should be monitored in priority. Depending on the type of grains that we use, we know how often uh, we can define how often we should test for mycotoxins. Definitely testing for mycotoxins in raw materials is a must. Um, we cannot avoid it and we have to test for the relevant one, the one that are at risk for the given species in the given region. And uh, once we know uh, how much is there, then we can decide what we do with the grains. Do we feed it to less sensitive species or stages? Do we feed it to the um, more sensitive one, etc.? cetera? Uh, ultimately, uh, in-feed solutions are also available to minimize the risk if animals will be exposed via the, via the feed, via the grains. Enhancing broiler performance is imperative to achieving your business goals. ZinPro is providing proven solutions to improve broiler performance from hatch to live production to processing. With customized nutrition and management programs, broilers can achieve a higher ROI, better feed conversion ratio, heavier body weights, and increased yield at the plant without sacrificing quality. Learn more at zimp.ro forward slash na broilers. Very good. So the key is, is really just the monitoring and understanding, and then there are some tools available uh, if the if the risk is, is identified. So great. Anything else on, on mycotoxins uh, to close out you would like the, the audience to be aware of and, and keep in mind? In the end, mycotoxin is something that we need to consider as the whole uh, one health package with the, with the animals. Uh, Mycotoxins, they are one of the stressors uh, affecting the animals, uh, and it's important to, to consider it as a whole uh, in terms of gut health approach. Uh, one professor here in Europe, uh, Professor Antodison, likes to call it the exposome. Uh, what we need to care for with our poultry in the end is what are they exposed to? Uh, xenobiotics, but not only on, on the environment and the global exposome will make the risk. Uh, sometimes high levels of mycotoxins will be bearable for the poultry if everything else is fine. Uh, and sometimes very small levels, low levels of mycotoxin 
may trigger a lot of damage uh, and poor performance or impaired vaccination just because we had already some other risk factors present on the on those birds. Very good. Well, hey, thank you for your insights. Uh, I think you've, you've um, given us a lot to, to think about and, and uh, from a big picture, but as well as some, some actionable things that, you know, in our own operations, we can really kind of put into practice. So I uh, really appreciate you sharing your work, Marie. Thanks. Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks uh, to everyone. That's a wrap on another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Uh, if you enjoyed, please uh, like and subscribe uh, so that you can catch the next one. Uh, and until next time, uh, this is Sam Rochel from Auburn University signing off from another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Thank you. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.